ever walked into the middle of someone else's conversation to find yourself lost in that discussion? We've all been there at one time or another, haven't we? They're laughing at some random comment made, and you have no earthly idea why they're laughing. They're referring to him or her when telling this story, and you're wondering who in the world are they talking about. It takes you some time, and you've got to use some context clues, don't you, to catch up and to get up to speed with what's going on in this conversation. Well, when we come to the letters of Paul in the New Testament, it's often a very similar thing for us. We're catching up, as it were, on a conversation that's already started, and we have to catch up a bit to that discussion. What is he talking about when he's referring to these disputes or to these false teachers? Where is this city located, and where are these believers gathering, and what about their particular location helps us understand some of what's going on in their particular context? Why does Paul seemingly suddenly switch issues and switch topics? Where in the world did that come from? Why is he addressing that right now? Well, as we come and as we open up to the book of 1 Thessalonians this morning, as we prepare to begin this new sermon series in this book, we have to ask similar questions as we come to this book. If we're going to accurately and faithfully understand this book in its original context as Paul originally meant it, and then understand and apply those truths to our lives today, we have to understand a bit of the history behind it and the context behind its composition. So that's what we're going to do this morning as we introduce the book of 1 Thessalonians. We're going to ask questions like, who wrote this letter and to whom was it written? And when was this letter written? And why was this letter written? And what are some of the major themes that Paul addresses or the author addresses in this letter as he's writing it? So this morning, I wanted to set the stage for us as we begin to study this book verse by verse over the coming months. I want to set the stage for us by answering these questions. If you will, turn to 1 Thessalonians and look there at verse 1. There in verse 1, we get a couple of the answers to these questions for us. We see the letter begin with Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Now, in a basic sense, a couple of our questions have already been answered right there, haven't they? Who wrote it and to whom was it written? But let's dive in just a little deeper and understand the background of this letter to the Thessalonians. So first, I want us to look at the author. Who is it that wrote this book? Well, we see there in verse 1 of chapter 1 that it's addressed from Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. Silvanus being here the Latin name for Silas. Well, that's easy enough to understand. We understand who those three men are. We understand that they're writing this letter. But how exactly did these three men uh, get connected with these believers in Thessalonica? Well, to understand that and to see the background on that, we need to turn back in our New Testaments to the book of Acts, specifically Acts 17. So I want to ask you to turn there now, if you will. Now, we know that the book of Acts is the historical account by Luke of the birth of the early church. After Jesus ascends to heaven, we see the Spirit descend on the believers at Pentecost, and then we see the gospel spread throughout the world, uh, fulfilling Acts 1-8, right? That the gospel would spread to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Much of the book of Acts, of the 28 chapters of the book of Acts, is comprised of three missionary journeys by the Apostle Paul. These three journeys where he is growing, going and he's spreading the gospel throughout the lands and, th- and planting churches as he goes. Well, soon after Paul's first missionary journey was complete, Paul receives a vision from Jesus that a man of Macedonia was urging them to come to Macedonia and to help them. You can read about that in Acts 16, verse 9. Well, Paul then takes up this call of Jesus to, to push the gospel into these areas, these areas that we now consider as Europe. 
Well, in order to preach the gospel to this area, Paul had to travel along this Roman road that was called the Via Ignatia. Now, this road was a very important Roman road that connected Greece to Byzantium, connecting what we now know as Europe to what we know as Asia. You see, before this road was built, this journey that Paul was about to embark on would have taken three to four months by ship, or it would have taken even five to six weeks by land. Uh, But once this Via Ignatia road was finished, the journey for Paul would take actually less than three weeks. It was a very important road in the Roman Empire. Now, as he travels along this road in his second missionary journey, he comes across several key cities, bringing the gospel to those areas and planting churches as he comes. We see him come to Philippi in Acts chapter 16, and while he's in Philippi, we know that he faces a great deal of persecution, and it ends up with he, Paul, and Silas being thrown into prison. And you know that story as God miraculously delivers them from the prison through an earthquake, and then we see the church begun and and planted there in Philippi, and then Paul and Silas leave from Philippi, and they continue spreading the gospel throughout the land. Well, as they leave Philippi, Luke picks up their journey here in Acts 17, and they're going to pass through a couple of towns of Amphipolis and Apollonia. Now, this journey would have been like us traveling along the Gulf Coast, maybe from Pensacola through Mobile, traveling toward New Orleans. Uh, Paul and Silas, they're traveling on this major road along the Aegean Sea, and they pass through these two cities, and they're heading toward this central city that we know of as Thessalonica. And that leads us now to our second question. To whom was this letter written? We know it's the church of the Thessalonians, but what do we know about this city called Thessalonica? Let me tell you a few things that we know that will help our understanding of this book as we come to it. We know first that Thessalonica was an important city in the Roman Empire. It was actually one of the largest cities in the Roman world. It had well over 100,000 residents. And not only was Thessalonica a large city, but it was also in a very strategic location. It was on this important road, this Via Ignatia, as well as being on the Aegean Sea. In order to understand kind of its importance, we could liken it sort of to New York City. New York City, which has a central harbor, has several important airports, has central train stations, has major interstates connecting through it. Thessalonica was centrally located sort of of like that. It also had fertile farmland, a good mining operation, a great fishing industry. So important was this city that one of the writers of that time, Miletus, once said this, so long as nature does not change, Thessalonica will remain wealthy and fortunate. So it was a large city. It was a very strategic city. And finally, another important note for us to know about Thessalonica is that it was a free city in the Roman world. Now, not every city had this privilege. In other locations, the Roman Empire had military occupation forces set up its own government there in that city, but not in Thessalonica. The Thessalonians instead controlled their own affairs and their own political situations, making them almost democratic, which was really unlike any other city in that region of that time. And all of this makes their political structure very important as we consider Acts 17. If we don't understand this political structure, some of Acts 17 and even the book of 1 Thessalonians won't make much sense to us. So let me quickly kind of lay that out for you. Uh, the, the political structure of the Thessalonians had a couple major different levels. The lowest level was what was called the citizen assembly. This was a type of local government that was consisted of individual citizens that would gather together to make decisions. This is what's indicated there in Acts 17, verse 5, when Luke said that the mob tried to bring them out, quote, to the crowd. Now, the other level of the political structure would have been what was called the city authorities, specifically referring to here to governmental leaders known as politarchs. 
Now, these politarchs were the upper level of government there in Thessalonica, and they were responsible for governing the city and making everything go smoothly. If they could not go make everything go smoothly, they themselves would be held accountable to the Roman Empire. So this is going to be very important to us as we come to Acts 17. The, these politarchs, they did everything possible to please the Roman Empire and its citizens. You see, they did not want to lose the privileges of being a free city there in Thessalonica. Losing those privileges would result in paying more taxes, having Roman military occupation in their land, losing their freedom, and so forth. They did everything they could to keep the Roman Empire and its citizens happy. Now, these politarchs had another very important role to play in Thessalonica. They also led the people in certain aspects of religious worship. You see, in that time, the leader of the Roman Empire, Caesar, was worshipped as a deity. And it was the politarch's job to maintain religious unity in this sense. You see, because of Thessalonica's key location, it had a diverse religious atmosphere. There were many temples and shrines within the city. In fact, the city itself was located only 50 miles from Mount Olympus, the home of the Greek gods like Zeus and others. You see, since Thessalonica was on this major road, it had this major harbor as well, these various religious opportunities brought the city a lot of money. And so they catered to every god out there in the world, Roman gods, Greek gods, Egyptian gods, Jewish god, and others. And all of these religious uh, religions were allowed, and a variety was allowed to be observed as long as the most important religious ceremony of the, of the city, the worship of the Roman Empire or emperor, was not impeded. As one author puts it, as long as they paid homage to Caesar, as long as they worshiped and honored him, they would have very little trouble with the Roman Empire. And so it's into this environment, into this prestigious and strategic city, with this religious environment, that Paul and his companions come preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ here in Acts 17. Now, with all of that background, let me read for you Acts 17, verses 1 through 10, as we see Paul and his companions bringing the gospel to Thessalonica. Verse 1. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Verse 4. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous. And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. When they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, that would be the politarch, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down. And Paul's right there. What a wonderful description of the church of God, right? What a wonderful description of missionaries who come bringing the gospel into foreign land. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar. Watch this. Here's the key. <clears throat> Saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people in the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, you see, it's important for us to understand those background issues in the city and the political structure and such in order to understand exactly what's going on. On here, we see Paul and his companions come into the city. They begin preaching the gospel in the synagogue. Many Jews and Greeks and leading women in the city believe, and as that happens, the Jews are jealous, and they bring the men before this lowest level of the government there in Thessalonica, the local assembly of the people. 
but they can't find the men. So they bring Jason, they bring him before the Politarch, and essentially they say, these men are telling our people that there is another king. And that is all the political leaders needed to hear to convince them to drive these men out of the city. And so they do. You see, the gospel of Jesus that Paul comes preaching was challenging the very core of the city here in Thessalonica, challenging its worship of Caesar, its love of money, and its love of Caesar, its love of freedom. And so Paul and Silas were forced to leave under the cloak of the dark night. So all of this is important then as we consider our last question in considering the background of this book. We've answered who wrote it. We know Paul together with Silas and Timothy. We've answered who it was written to, to the Thessalonians here in this strategic city of Thessalonica. We haven't answered when it was written, but very quickly to tell you, tell you it's very likely the earliest letter that we have written by Paul. Sometime around AD 49 through 51. Most scholars think that Paul probably wrote this letter very early during his 18-month stay in Corinth that we read about in Acts 18. Now that all leads us to this final question. Why was this letter written? And that's where understanding Acts 17 comes into play. You see, at its most basic level, this letter is written by Paul and his companions because they deeply care for these brothers and sisters. And they're concerned for these brothers and sisters as they are new believers of whether or not they would hold fast and stand firm for the gospel, even in the midst of the persecution that they knew they were going to face. You see, Paul and Silas and Timothy, they have just been forcefully driven out of the city under the cover of night. They have no tearful goodbyes with these new brothers and sisters in Christ. No last words of comfort and encouragement. No opportunity to make sure that this church is established and healthy and ready for the persecution that is to come. None of that. Instead, all of a sudden, they're led away. And Paul is bothered by this. He's concerned for these Thessalonian believers. And so he sends Timothy to check on them and to exhort them in the faith. If you turn your attention back to the book of 1 Thessalonians, we read in chapter 3 there of 1 Thessalonians, in chapter 3 in the first few verses, we read, Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind, that is Paul and Silas, at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. So we see Paul and Silas, they stay behind. They send Timothy to check on the Thessalonians to exhort them and to establish them. Well, Timothy does so, and when he returns with his report, we read in verse 6 of chapter 3 that Timothy brings good news of their faith and their love and their longing to see Paul again. Uh, But though this report is good, these believers clearly still have some questions. They still have some struggles. They still need some exhortation and continuing in their pursuit of love and faith and holiness. And so in that context, for those reasons, we see Paul write this letter that we now know of as 1 Thessalonians. Now, as we read through this letter, we're going to notice several themes emerge along the way. Several themes rise to the surface as prominent throughout the letter, and we will address these as we come to them in the months and weeks to come. Well, what are those major themes? Let me quickly give you four of them. The first major theme that we see throughout the book of 1 Thessalonians is that we see reminders, instructions, and encouragement concerning the second coming of Jesus. In fact, this theme of the second coming of Christ is actually mentioned in every single chapter of the book of 1 Thessalonians. We see it mentioned in verse 10 of chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 of chapter 2, verse 13 of chapter 3, verses 13 through 18 of chapter 4, and verses 1 through 11 and 23 and 24 of chapter 5. I would argue it's probably the most prominent theme that we're going to see throughout this book. This church of the Thessalonians was obviously asking some very important questions about the future and about the coming of Christ. They're asking questions like, what happens to those who die? What about those who are alive when Jesus returns? 
What about those who don't believe? And so Paul, throughout the letter, explains for, the, for this church, for these believers, what they are to expect. And for us, what we are to expect. That at Jesus' future coming, the dead in Christ will rise and will be caught up with, to meet the Lord. And that unbelievers will be subject to God's wrath on account of their sin. But Christians who have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus alone will be instead delivered from God's wrath, inheriting salvation rather than condemnation. Now, there's a lot that we're going to examine along the way about Jesus' second coming in these passages but just note that this is a key theme throughout this book. As we progress through this book, we're going to see how this second coming of Jesus is something that we eagerly await as believers, something that we put our hope in, not in the present circumstances and the present realities in earth today, but we put our hope in this future reality of Jesus' coming to make all things right. We're going to see how the second coming of Jesus serves as a catalyst for our holy living and our godliness in our lives today, and ever so increasing in our lives as followers of Jesus. And we're going to see how the second coming of Jesus spurs us on with hope and steadfastness in the midst of, of persecution and peril and pain that we face in this sin-ridden world in which we currently live. And certainly these are all reminders that each and every one of us as God's people today need just as much as those first century Christians at the church in Thessalonica. The second key theme that we're going to see surface throughout the book is this conversation from Paul about ministry in the church and encouragement of the, the faith and the work of love of these Thessalonian believers. We're going to see Paul give us some insight into his view of ministry in chapter 2, he talks about the boldness that he has to declare the gospel in the midst of conflict, that he speaks not to please men, but to please God, no matter the cost. He lays down one of the fundamental realities for us of a God-centered approach to ministry, a boldness in speaking the truth regardless of the outcome. But then he also later describes his ministry as being gentle like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. And so he highlights this kind of shepherding, the shepherding role that the pastor and minister is to exhibit. And in so doing, he lays all of us an example of how we are to love and minister to one another. Uh, Paul also strongly commends the Thessalonians, uh, Thessalonian believers throughout this letter. He thanks God for their work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in chapter 1. He calls them his hope and joy and crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus in chapter 2. He tells them how they have been a great comfort to his and to Silas's and to Timothy's, Timothy's faith in chapter 3. And he commends them for their example of brotherly love there in chapter 4. Throughout this letter, we're going to see this consistent theme surface uh, regarding ministry in the church and encouragement. The third major theme that we see throughout the letter is this, this focus on suffering and persecution. In fact, I think this is probably the central reason that Paul writes this letter, as we just mentioned, to help Christians face suffering in a Christ-centered way. Immediately, we're introduced to this in verse 6 of chapter 1, as Paul notes how the Thessalonian believers encountered the very same persecution as did he and Silas and Timothy as they became imitators of him and of Jesus. Both Paul and believers in the church face suffering, and so this theme of suffering and persecution runs throughout the book. We're going to see him explain to us central theological perspectives about suffering and how we as believers are to approach that in a Christ-centered way. And I believe as we, as we encounter these themes time and time again as they come up in this book for us, it will help us as God's people today develop and, and enact a biblical approach to the suffering that we all experience in our lives as well. And finally, the fourth major theme that we come across in this letter is the nature of the Christian life and the necessity of holiness in this world. 
But we see this last theme tied to the first three throughout the book, but it's specifically tied to the second coming of Jesus. Because we see Paul clearly lay out for those saints who are destined to be with Jesus in his second coming that they must be holy and blameless in this life. It's the reason that Paul's going to conclude the book the way he does. He concludes the book by telling us to pursue sexual purity, to love those who minister to us, to be at peace among ourselves, to admonish the idle, to encourage the faint-hearted, to help the weak, and to be patient with them all. You see, Paul is calling on these Thessalonian Christians, and thus all of us as God's children, to live lives of holiness and godliness in this world. And he reminds us at the end of the letter of how God's faithfulness is actually working in us and through us, enabling us to pursue such things that we would not be able to on our own. You see, brothers and sisters, as we make our way through this small but very powerful book of 1 Thessalonians in the months to come, I believe that we're going to be strengthened. We're going to be challenged. We're going to be encouraged and equipped And we're going to be taught by God's word concerning all of these major themes and much more. I I don't know about you, but I am personally very excited to go through this book with you over the coming months. And to see how Paul brought the gospel to bear upon these Thessalonian believers and how God will do the same for you and I through this inspired book of the New Testament. Now, as we end our time together this morning... I want to do something that I believe is important for us as we try to get a a full sense of the letter. I want to actually read, end our time together, by reading the entire book of 1 Thessalonians, all five chapters. Now, I've read all five chapters, the whole book in one sitting, at least a dozen times this week. Each time, it's come out to about 10 minutes or so. So I want to ask you to pause real quick as you're about to turn off your computer. You're about to close things down. I want to ask you not to turn off the live stream right now, but to follow along with me. I know that as soon as I said I was going to close our time by reading the whole book, some of you are thinking, all right, uh, what's for lunch? Well, let me ask you to please don't do that. You see, I'm, I'm convinced that far too few of us actually sit and read a full letter in one sitting. But I think it's important for us to do so, to, to get a, a scope of the whole thing, the, the whole forest, as it were, before we dive in verse by verse and dissect the trees in the coming weeks and months. To make it easier for you, I'm going to have the verses on the screen and the ESV so that uh, I know for some of us it can get confusing if I'm reading the ESV and you've got the NASB or another translation. If you want to do that, that's perfectly fine. But in order to make it not confusing and easiest on you, you will have them on the screen as we go. As Paul ends this letter in verse 27 of chapter 5, he says these words, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. Well, just as the Thessalonians would have heard this letter read to them as they were assembled as a local church, so now I want us to hear the letter in the same way. Written by Paul to the Thessalonians, but inspired by God, to teach, reprove, correct, and train each of us in righteousness as God's children today. So follow along with me as I start in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. 
For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please men, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses in God also how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who called, calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the church of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them at last. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith, for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you, for this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you were standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God just as you were doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who don't know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, for that indeed is what you were doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, 
and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and to be, and be dependent on no one. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are, all, are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, to die for us that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you were doing. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to, uh, and, and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Let's pray together.